Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome this evening to St Mary's University. It is both a personal and a professional honour to introduce Sir Ivor Roberts to St Mary's University in Twickenham. As a diplomat of unparalleled experience, the current President of Trinity College at Oxford, Sir Ivor Roberts brings to St Mary's a wealth of experience professional and personal, which you are about to hear this evening. Our institution here at St Mary's is built on very firm foundations, established by the Catholic Church in 1850. Our faith teaches us about creating a community of support, addressing inequality, and it supports the rights of the individual. To this day, we are proud of our distinctive identity based on the teachings of blessed John Henry Newman and his idea of a university. Our ambition to create a friendly, inclusive and intellectually rigorous learning community is not exclusive to the Catholic faith. That is why this university welcomes staff and students of all faiths and of none. Creating a positive, enriching dialogue between individuals strengthens our community here, focusing on our mutual goals, working hard, working together, and advancing education for all. Here at St Mary's, we are expanding our own portfolio in the areas of politics and public policy and diplomacy. The head of our School of Arts and Humanities, Professor Karen Saunders, herself a member of the United Nations Public Diplomacy Experts Group, is working with her team on the proposals across the piece on diplomacy and public policy. They will, I'm sure, be seeking Sir Ivor's valuable expertise to inform the various programme developments. Through his vocation, Sir Ivor has unique experience in identifying and highlighting when opposing sides have similar interests and in encouraging and developing between them the practice of working together. A stalwart of British diplomacy, in his 38 years of service to the country, he has had postings to Lebanon, Paris, Canberra and Madrid, to name just a few. As Chargé d'Affaires and later Ambassador to Yugoslavia from 1994 to 1997, during the Bosnian Civil War and the descent into war in Kosovo, he was an advocate for lasting peace and worked constantly to try to halt the policy of violent oppression across the region. Immediately following the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, Sir Ivor was Her <coughs> Majesty's Ambassador in Dublin. From there, he undertook his final ambassadorial role in Rome. Sir Ivor's dedication to the creation of bilateral and multilateral relationships between factions is something that is central to his life as a diplomat. In his lecture tonight, he will explore the extent to which diplomats may work outside what may be termed ordinary morality in their treatment of those who have carried out atrocities in the interests of peace. That's the professional side. On the personal side, Sir Ivor and Lady Roberts are welcome back here to Strawberry Hill because this was the place where they lived when they first got married. And I believe that, Lady Roberts, this is your first visit back to Strawberry Hill since 1975. So you're very, very welcome home this evening. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I did say personal and professional because this gentleman to my right, I've known in both roles, in the Foreign Office, in a professional role, he was my boss. And I have a confession to make to that boss tonight. I think had he known it when he selected me to go to the British Embassy to Italy first, I think he would have said no. But when he was ambassador in Dublin, 
and I was a young pup of a private secretary on the Prime Minister's staff in Downing Street. And the Prime Minister was tasked to appear in front of the Liaison Committee, who are the chairs of all the select committees. It's the most feared parliamentary committee there is. And I was tasked to ring around a number of European capitals to find out how many people worked for the head of government. Because one of the questions from the Conservative opposition was to say that under Tony Blair, the numbers in Downing Street had risen dramatically. So I phoned Paris and I phoned Berlin and I phoned Madrid and I decided to phone the British Embassy in Dublin. And a very kind official on Survivor's staff said, we'll find out that answer for you. And they used their contacts to phone the department of the Taoiseach, who was then Bertie Ahern. And they got through to the head of personnel in the department of the Taoiseach. And they came back with a number. So this was on a Wednesday. And I thanked them gratefully. And they said, what's it for? And I said, it's for a piece of internal research for number 10. Fast forward to Thursday, and the Prime Minister is sitting in front of the Liaison Committee on live television, and he is asked by one of the people, under your tenure, Downing Street has doubled in size. And he said, look, he said, I, I don't accept, he said, that Downing Street is comparatively bigger, he said, than other centres of government in Europe. He said, for example, I was just reading figures this morning about Bertie Ahern. He said, and he has three times more staff than I have. <laughs> that was on a Thursday. On Sunday, the main story in Ireland's main newspaper, the Sunday Independent, ran with the following headline, Bertie has three times more spin doctors than Blair. <laughs> Monday morning, nine o'clock, the phone rings into Downing Street and it is the British ambassador in Dublin trying to find out who is the guy in there with an Irish accent who phoned this embassy on Wednesday. So Downing Street managed to protect me, to which the ambassador said, I want you to know that whoever he is, he has single-handedly destroyed my relationship with the Taoiseach. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sir Ivor Roberts. Well, uh, despite that uh, confession, I'm very grateful to you, Francis, for the invitation to, to come here and for that generous, mainly generous introduction, uh, sort of introduction my father would have loved and my, my mother would have believed. Um, this may seem a strange title to um, bring to a university rooted in religion, ethics, and moral values, but I hope in the course of it you'll see um, where it's going. It's become a familiar trope to describe politics, and by extension politicians, as dirty. Scandals involving expenses, corrupt practices like paying your spouse hundreds of thousands of euros for not doing very much. Cronyism have all contributed to this grubby image. These scandals are a far cry from the political philosophy concept of dirty hands, whereby a political leader, whether a prince, king or prime minister, acts in violation of ordinary morality, sometimes using violence even against his own followers, in the wider interests of the state or the common good. The philosophical justification for dirty hands has a long pedigree, though its present currency is largely owed to an American political theorist, Michael Waltzer, in an influential article, Political Action, The Problem of Dirty Hands, adapting it from Jean-Paul Sartre's play of the same name. But its most celebrated exponent, although he didn't use the words, Machiavelli, provided the early theory. The prince must learn how not to be good, though he should maintain the appearance of virtue and indeed behave virtuously when the cost is low. 
Now, this is because Machiavelli sees a distinction between public and private morality. A prince's public morality dictates that he must be prepared to suppress any moral squeamishness if the interests of the state or common good are at risk. Machiavelli is the arch-apostle of the consequentialist school, or put more crudely, that of the end justifying the means. Is this distinction between political and conventional morality limited to political life? Clearly, if the country is at war, it could argue that it is entitled to spy on others, bribe their citizens, and spread disinformation. But in what other circumstances is such defiance of conventional morality acceptable? Of course, we can all think of examples where the greater public good requires deceit and treachery. An undercover police agent may be pretending to be an animal rights activist when he's in fact spying on other genuine activists to ensure that legitimate protest does not transmogrify into terrorism. But even in these circumstances, some elements, of, some elements of conventional or private morality need to be preserved. Few would argue, I imagine, that a police agent in those circumstances should enter into a liaison with one of those he's spying on and perhaps father a child by them. But diplomats, too, have on occasions to go down the path of public as opposed to private morality if the overall aim is to safeguard the state which they represent. A simple definition of diplomacy is the conduct of business between states by peaceful means, the best means yet devised by civilization, preventing international relations from being governed by force alone. But where diplomacy has given way to war, where peaceful means have proved inadequate to resolve conflict between states, the diplomat must try to use his or her best endeavours to bring war to an end, to resolve conflict, if necessary, by means which defy conventional morality. Diplomats should be prepared to meet and treat with people who have blood on their hands, who may have carried out major crimes, including war crimes, ethnic cleansing or terrorism, and to negotiate with them in the greater common good of seeing war brought to an end and bloodshed minimised. Willingness to sup with the devil in this way is sometimes characterised as a form of appeasement. But a moment's thought will show what a facile and intellectually incoherent position that is. Appeasement involves giving a dictator or autocrat what he wants in the hope of minimising his further demands and dissuading him from going to war. But where there's already war, the correct course for the diplomat is to find a solution which to the best extent possible meets the basic needs or requirements of the parties in conflict, not necessarily their desiderata. Where one party has been the clear aggressor, the ideal is obviously to bring the aggression to an end, to return to the status quo ante and punish the aggressor. But the best should not be the enemy of the good. And this is particularly the case with a civil war where frontiers can be, and usually are, very easily disputed. I'll return to the question of the priority of peace over justice at the conclusion of this lecture. A good example of the necessity to sup with the devil was the Bosnian civil war of the 1990s. Egged on by the presidents of Serbia and Croatia, the Serbs and Croats in Bosnia turned on their Bosnian Muslim neighbours with the aim of carving up multi-ethnic Bosnia, itself a microcosm of Yugoslavia, between them. I spent the best part of four years as the head of the British Embassy and Ambassador in Belgrade negotiating with the Serbian autocrat, once described as the Butcher of the Balkans, Slobodan Milosevic. Here he is pictured in his courting days with his wife-to-be, the formidable Mira Markovic. How did this enigmatic figure rise to become one of the most powerful and hated figures of the 20th century? Was it through his wife? The joke went the rounds in Belgrade of an occasion when Milosevic and his wife were in the car 
when it ran out of petrol. Although as a result of sanctions there was an acute shortage of petrol, Mira persuaded a petrol pump attendant to fill up their car. When Milosevic asked her who the attendant was, she replied, my first love. So, retorted Milosevic, if you'd married him, you would have been a petrol pump attendant's wife. No, said Mira, if I'd married him, he would have been president of Serbia. <laughs> Milosevic seized center stage with his famous call to the Serbs of Kosovo to stay in Kosovo for the sake of your ancestors and descendants and his promise that nobody should ever dare to beat you again. Having been surprised by the warm response in Kosovo to his remarks, Milosevic quickly decided to turn the nationalist movement of Kosovo Serbs to his advantage and to seize power, ideally in the whole of the then Yugoslavia, but if not then, in all parts where Serbs lived. Milosevic's image as the Balkan butcher was of course clearly lodged with me by the time I reached Belgrade in early 1994. Largely invisible he may have been, but his brooding presence permeated every quarter of Belgrade. It was impossible to hold any political discussion without his name cropping up almost immediately. As his biographer says, all the Norman, normal institutions of the state exist, but only one functions, Slobodan Milosevic. It, is, it was as though he was the only three-dimensional figure in Serbian politics, while the others were cardboard cutouts. His favorite operating style was conspiratorial, busily promoting and removing members from his circle of trusted ad advisors. It created the atmosphere of fear and uncertainty among those with whom he worked. Those who stood up to him quickly earned not respect, but enmity. This cold narcissus, as a psychologist described him, was nonetheless capable of great personal charm, as many international visitors and negotiators found. Yet Milosevic never expressed any regret or sadness for the fate of thousands, whether it was Serbs, Albanians, Muslims or Croats. It was as though their fate was merely a question of bureaucratic statistics, not personal suffering and tragedy. He was a man with no strategy and little sense of anticipation, but he reacted incredibly quickly to events when they happened, without any long-term vision. His biographer described him as, at one and the same time, a pyromaniac and a fireman. In my briefings before departure with the Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd and the European Union's negotiator Lord David Owen, I was urged to get inside Milosevic's head to help them understand his thinking. Both believed that the key to the resolution of the war in Bosnia lay with Milosevic. Because at that time most of the negotiations were carried out directly with the Bosnian parties themselves, with scant results. Hurd and Owen believed that without Milosevic's engagement, the long haul to peace would stretch still further. But he was not, of course, the only player. Early on in my time in Belgrade, I met the three key Bosnian Serb leaders in my residence there. They were known as the three Ks. The first two, Radovan Karadzic, the leader of the Bosnian Serbs, and Momchilo Krajšnik, the Speaker of the Bosnian Serb Assembly, formerly Milosevic's creatures, became, as he saw them, too puffed up, capable of defying his wishes, Frankenstein's monsters. They are now convicted war criminals sentenced to 40 years and 20 years respectively. The last member of this trio, Nikola Koljevic, committed suicide while I was in Belgrade. At this meeting, Karadzic did all the talking, a tedious process as all his verbs were in the past sense. Past tense. Not surprisingly, we made no progress. As the unholy trinity left, the Bosnian Serb Vice President Koljevic, an unlikely Shakespeare scholar, took me aside to say that he would like to continue our conversation. We met several times over the next few months as the international community tried to refine a map 
<coughs> which would divide Bosnia up into two entities, bringing the civil war to an end. And indeed, about a month later, Radovan Karadzic came back to my house to show me a map of Bosnia divided, which he said that he couldn't put forward himself as he would risk being deposed or even assassinated by his fellow Serbs. He would, however, be prepared to have a map imposed on the Bosnian Serbs by the international community. I promised to have it considered, but when that failed, I then travelled into Bosnia to try to persuade Karadzic to accept an internationally backed alternative. But he was in a defiant mood, delivering a lengthy, and I mean lengthy, diatribe about the Serbs being once more the guardians at the gate, keeping the Muslims at bay on behalf of Christian Europe. Milosevic too tried and failed to win the Bosnian Serbs over, so responded by the closure of the border between Serb-held Bosnia and Serbia proper. I continued nevertheless to see a good deal of the Bosnian Serb Vice President Kolevic, who, had he lived, would certainly have been indicted for war crimes, including the shelling and targeting of the National Library in Sarajevo. My consistent aim was to persuade him, and through him Karadzic, whom he'd known for 30 years, of settling an end to the war on territorial terms, which while unpalatable to both sides, ought to be broadly acceptable. This internal manoeuvring between the Serbs in Belgrade and the Bosnian Serb body politic and military continued for some time with very little progress. Eventually, I suggested to the Foreign Office that I go into Bosnia to see whether, with another fighting season set to begin, something might give. I duly met Kolevic and the Speaker of the Assembly, Krajšnik, at the Bosnian border town of Zvornik. The hotel where we met was freezing. It was January 1995, and there was virtually no heating oil in Bosnia because of sanctions. We kept our overcoats on during the meeting. Krajšnik was known as the Serbian Brezhnev, his inflexible mindset, his peasant cunning, and above all, his infinite capacity for prevarication, all combined to make him a formidable and wearying interlocutor. He thrived on these lengthy meetings with political opponents and international negotiators. He enjoyed wearing down, exhausting and frustrating them. Despite seven hours of talks, there was no breakthrough. Turning to the military, I arranged to meet General Ratko Mladic in Belgrade. My aim was to reinforce the message that the international community's map for the division of Bosnia should be accepted, that attacks on safe areas, safe areas should cease completely, and that delivery of humanitarian supplies should be allowed unhindered. I was ushered into the room by a fellow Bosnian Serb general of Mladic's, General Gvero, who behaved more like a ward nurse taking visitors to a mentally unstable patient. Mladic was out of uniform, wearing an undersized black shirt and was boastful and swaggering in his manner. The more we argued, and there were no points of con congruence, the angrier he became. His bull neck bulged. He recalled how his first silk shirt had been made from British parachutes dropping supplies to the partisans during the Second World War. Now he announced he would never buy a silk shirt from Britain again. The Royal Air Force now dropped only bombs. Another wholly unproductive, disappointing, and distinctly disagreeable meeting. Showing us out, General Gvero was apologetic. You have to excuse the general, he said. He's not at his best today. But Mladic could be even worse. As the situation on the ground deteriorated in the summer of 1995, the Bosnian Serbs seized over 300 United Nations troops, including a substantial segment of British soldiers. Here's one tied to a telegraph pole by the Bosnian Serbs. Getting them released proved a tortuous business. After an abortive visit to Bosnia to see the Bosnian Serb leadership, having secured guarantees that I wouldn't be taken hostage myself, I decided to turn to Milosevic, pressing him to use all his powers to get the soldiers released. 
He told me he decided to mobilize his secret weapon. Jovan Stanisic, the head of his secret police, to secure the UN soldiers released. I asked how this would help. Milosevic said that his message to Karadzic through Stanisic was simple, if direct. Release the UN troops, or I will have you killed. <laughs> Conventional morality would have required me to discourage him from such ruthless measures, but I judged the greater good to be the release of our soldiers, and the threat delivered by Stanisic turned out to be pretty effective. A few days later, they were indeed released, and I went to meet them when they reached Serbia at around three o'clock in the morning. Within a few weeks, a new nadir was reached as the Bosnian Serbs murdered 8,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica in East Bosnia under the powerless noses of Dutch UN soldiers. This was a classic example of an inflexible approach to peacemaking. Several peace agreements were on the table in the period between the start of the war in 1992 and the Srebrenica massacre over three years later. One of the most promising was called the Cutilero Plan, after the Portuguese ambassador who drew it up. This proposed ethnic power sharing on all administrative levels in Bosnia and the devolution of central government to local ethnic communities. While Cutilero's initial plan was rejected, he put forward a revised draft of the original, and this is it, which on the 18th of March in 1992 was agreed and signed by all three sides. Alia Izetbegovic for the Bosnian Muslims, Karadzic for the Bosnian Serbs, and the Bosnian Croat leader, Mate Boban. But days later, after a meeting with the US ambassador to Yugoslavia, Warren Zimmerman, Izzet Begovic withdrew his signature and declared his opposition to any division of Bosnia. What was said and by whom remains unclear. Zimmerman denied that he told Izzet Begovic that if he withdrew his signature, the United States would grant recognition to Bosnia as an independent state and support the Bosnian Muslims militarily. What is indisputable is that Izzet Begovic, that same day, withdrew his signature and renounced the agreement. A year later, another promising plan, the Van Soen Plan, which involved the division of Bosnia into 10 semi-autonomous regions and received the backing of the United Nations, was undermined by the US administration, who described it as deeply flawed, despite the fact that one of the authors was Cyrus Vance, a former American Secretary of State. The problem with the plan was that it would have required the presence of 30,000 American ground troops in Bosnia to enforce, a move that at that time President Clinton's administration wouldn't countenance. The consequence of these failed plans was that the war dragged on for a full three and a half years with the consequent bloodshed, raising of towns, and finally the grotesque massacre in Srebrenica. Imperfect peace plans are usually, nearly always, to be preferred to continuing warfare and bloodshed. Rubbing shoulders with war criminals in trying to resolve conflict between warring, warring factions wasn't the only way to dirty one's hands. One of our trickiest assignments in Belgrade was to support the independent opposition media in Serbia in a way which didn't get them into trouble with the authorities. One of the most effective ways I discovered was giving them hard cash in Deutschmarks to buy often scarce and expensive newsprint. We did this by using the diplomatic bag to bring in, <coughs> to bring in Deutschmarks under diplomatic privilege money which the independent media themselves had raised abroad, but were unable to bring in conventionally without the risk of Milosevic confiscating it. One of my younger political officers was usually dispatched to Budapest across the border to collect the money and then bring it back to hand over 
surreptitiously to the leading independent media organisation, B92 Radio. This was, of course, a breach of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, but I judged it, while illegal, as in the broader interest of both the West and indeed the Serbian people, that they should be exposed to independent media rather than force-fed on government propaganda. We were never discovered by the regime, though when the Foreign Office found out, they were unhappy, to put it mildly. <laughs> on another occasion, I was nearly expelled for breaching diplomatic convention again when I imported uh, decoders for B92 under diplomatic privilege to disperse throughout Serbia at regional independence stations, allowing them to rebroadcast B92's output throughout the country. I was summoned by the foreign minister before breakfast one day to receive a protest at my activities. I refuted any suggestion that they were against diplomatic protocol, saying that the real reason for the protest was an attempt at censorship and if it were not withdrawn, I would strongly recommend to Brussels the withdrawing of trading concessions to Yugoslavia recently granted by the European Union. The bluff worked. The next day, they reversed their position and the decoders stayed. Again, the Foreign Office lawyers pointed out that what I'd done was in breach of international law. I move on now to the Kosovo crisis. The origins of this go back to the 14th century, but you'll be glad to hear that I'm not going into the details of that tonight. Suffice it to say that having lost Kosovo to the Ottomans in the 14th century, Serbia required it after, reacquired it after more than 500 years <coughs> in the First Balkan War of 1912. The problem was that by then Kosovo no longer had a Serb majority. The great majority of the people were Albanian Muslims. And when the new state of Yugoslavia was formed as a result of the Versailles Peace Conference, the Albanians found themselves trapped in a loveless marriage with their Serb neighbours in Kosovo, while the new Albanian state had been created nearby, which left more than half the total Albanian population of the region outside Albania's borders, mainly in Kosovo a sure recipe for future disaster. As Yugoslavia started to break up in the early 1990s, the problem became acute as Milosevic emasculated the local regional Kosovo assembly and government and ruled centrally and ruthlessly from Belgrade. In my last days in Serbia, I went down to Kosovo with increasing regularity to see what could be done to prevent the situation deteriorating further. This was always a thankless task as Serb and Albanians strove to put across their version of events, narratives which had virtually nothing in common. Contacts with the Albanians varied in kind from the peace-loving Kosovo Gandhi, as he was known, Ibrahim Rugova, to some very hardline characters who believed that the only way to resolve the problems with Serbia was through bloodshed and violence. It was the latter who spawned the emergence of the Kosovo Liberation Army, described by the US as a terrorist organization one month, and then a few weeks later, liberation heroes who must be supported by the West. I visited Kosovo about 20 times in the last two or three years of my time in Belgrade to urge a path of peace on the Albanians and on the Serbs the necessity for a political amnesty and meaningful autonomy for the Albanians. One of the few moments of hope at that time was the successful negotiation by the Catholic Sant'Egidio community of an education agreement between Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo. The Pope's representative, Monsignor, now Archbishop Paglia, asked for my help in drafting some of the key documents which I happily did. Less happily, the education agreement was never actually implemented, despite fine words on both sides. The impending disaster in Kosovo duly took place with several massacres and massive displacement of people. The NATO bombing campaign went on for nearly three months, 
And just as it seemed likely to fail, Milosevic folded when he realized that even the Russians were no longer prepared to support him. My time in Dublin was a great contrast. The Good Friday Agreement had recently been signed amid general relief at the end of the Troubles. Also, we thought, the worst atrocity in the whole terrorist campaign, the bombing in Omar, in which 31 people were killed, including two unborn babies, took place just before my arrival. The perpetrators, the dissident real IRA, viscerally opposed to the Good Friday Agreement, were still very active. At one stage, I waived my diplomatic immunity to give evidence in the Special Criminal Court against its head, Mickey McKevitt. It was some relief when he was sent down for 20 years. One of the difficult questions which delayed the proper implementation of the Good Friday Agreement was the question of the so-called on-the-runs. These were members of the IRA wanted for terrorist crimes who were on the run from British justice, often in the Republic of Ireland or in the United States. I spent some time with one of the on-the-runs, Rita O'Hare, who had been charged in 1972 with the attempted murder of a British soldier in Belfast, among other crimes. Released on bail, she fled to the Republic. Sinn Féin, whose representative in the United States she currently is, believed that she could play a useful role in the peace process if allowed to return to Northern Ireland. When I met her in Dublin over lunch, I asked her to use her undoubted influence on the IRA to persuade them to decommission their weapons, a precondition for securing full unionist support for the peace process. To meet someone who was a fugitive from British justice was probably not in the diplomatic manual either, but it seemed to me important to leave no stone unturned to bring about the full implementation of the Good Friday Agreement. Tony Blair's Chief of Staff, Jonathan Powell, subsequently ran into a storm when he revealed that he'd warned Gerry Adams that Rita O'Hare should not return to Northern Ireland as she would be arrested if she did so. There was some suggestion that in doing so he might have broken the law, but Jonathan was merely repeating something of which Rita O'Hare was absolutely aware. Again, this neatly demonstrates the need to take risks and operate on the borders between legality and illegality in the interests of the well-being of a community or, in the case of Northern Ireland, the two communities. In fact, as early as the 1970s, an MI6 agent, Michael Oatley, had been in contact with the IRA despite the government's protestations that they would never talk to them unless there was a permanent ceasefire. So what did I learn from nearly four decades of attempted conflict resolution? Overall, I believe that with very few exceptions, Nazi Germany, Islamic State being egregious examples, diplomats should be prepared to sully their hands and overcome their own moral repugnance at dealing with dictators, war criminals and terrorists in the interests of securing a peace agreement. And while in an ideal world, peace and justice should go hand in hand, in the semi-dystopia we seem to inhabit, there has to be compromise. Sometimes peace has to trump justice, or at least justice has to be deferred. International justice was initiated at the Nuremberg trials at the conclusion of the Second World War. Most of those accused and almost invariably found guilty deserved their fate, but it was very much victor's justice as the war finished, unlike the First World War, with Germany's unconditional surrender. There was no question of any war crimes by the Allies being judged, still less punished. So justice can be seen through various optics. As Thabo Mbeki and Mahmoud Mamdini recently argued, there's a time and a place for courts, as in Germany after Nazism, but it is not in the midst of conflicts or a non-functioning political system. Courts are ill-suited to inaugurating a new political order after civil wars. They can only come into the picture after such a new order is already in place. Their comments are not original. Human rights activists have long had to accept 
that in the interests of peace, justice, if not, not dispensed with, may have to be substantially delayed. This is not a message which is popular with many in the human rights community. But as Louise Arbour, head of the International Crisis Group and former head of the <coughs> International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda recently argued, to pretend that there is no tension between peace and justice and that we deserve both without explaining how is unhel unhelpful. Ladies and gentlemen, we live in an imperfect world. To claim otherwise may win us the moral high ground. It is no guarantee that we will win the peace. Thank you. Thank you.